so guys in this video we're going to do one of the most important technically challenging and mind-bending proofs that you would come across in functional analysis um, this proof is very rigorous it requires you to build upon layers and layers of abstractions but trust me if you can understand this stuff then life would become very much easier later on so why why are we delving into such complicated proofs the reason for this is with every proof that we understand with every abstraction that we understand it gives an extension to our thinking it gives us a new pathway it opens up it opens up a new door in our case so without further ado i would uh, start with the proof of the theorem let me define a few things first so we are going to prove again isometric isomorphisms mm, between sequence spaces this time so in, in the last video i showed that there exists a function psi from cn star to cn and this psi is an isometric isomorphism in this video i would be talking about sequence spaces so i have defined sequence spaces like this in a previous video let me go back to it again so each element in my space lp so this is space lp it's called a sequence space and now each element in this space is an infinite sequence which can be written like this and the special property of this space is is that every element in this space so every infinite sequence is bounded what i mean to say is that this quantity is less than infinity if i do the moduli of each individual element in my infinite sequence take it to the power p and sum all of them then it turns out to be less than infinity if every element in this space satisfies this property then this space is called the lp space so again i need to make one thing clear too that p is greater than or equal to 1 so again what is a lp space it's a sequence space where every point is an infinite sequence which satisfies this property and similar in the case of lq so if i have lq then i would just change this quantity from p to q and the thing about the case in consideration here in this example is that we have given that 1 by p plus 1 by q is equals to 1 and we need to prove that there exists an isometric isomorphism between the dual space of lp which we write as lp star so again dual space of anything is that thing star dual space of cn cn star dual space of rn rn star so the dual space of lp which is lp star there exists an isometric isomorphism from lp star to lq which means so as we have seen in the previous example the elements in lp star can be identified with elements in lq so this is like saying you are the same but you are not the same so we saw that earlier when we when we said that there exists an isometric isomorphism between 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 c and star to cn which which meant that elements in c and star can be uniquely identified with elements in cn we have to go through the same procedure again but now um things have become exponentially complex and now let's try to break them piece by piece so this was just an example explaining you what an lp space means now we change our notations a bit we change our symbols a bit so have a look at this diagram i have my space lq and capital x is an infinite sequence in my lq space and i have my space lp and capital y is again an infinite sequence in lp space now i say that the formula psi x phi is equals to summation 
n going from 1 to infinity, xn, yn, where these are the respective elements of this infinite sequence. So you can think of this infinite sequence as x1, x2, x3. So I say that this formula defines a functional functional in LP star because LP star because Holder's inequality Holder's inequality shows me that norm of psi x y is less than or equal to the respective norms of x in q space and norm of y in p space. I know it looks a bit complicated. So why this? So essentially Holder's inequality, if you remember it, we had discussed it before. So what was Holder's inequality? Holder's inequality essentially says that if I have an infinite sequence, or if I have, let's let's think of it this way, forget everything. If I have modulus of xn, yn, then it would be less than or equal to this quantity. So Holder's inequality essentially shows me that this quantity has to be less than these two. And what are these two quantities? They are nothing but the individual norms in Q space and in P space. So again, what happened? What happened is I say that I use this formula based upon this formula. I can say that psi x is an element of LP star, which is the dual space of LP because this thing is less than infinity that is finite so that is what i mean when i say that it's well defined so if i have a space and if i have a dual space then the functional would give me a real number it would map it to a real number so i can say that since this quantity is bounded which one this thing is bounded that's why my psi x is indeed an element of LP star. And now, let's go back to our notes. So that's the same thing in our notes. So we have from Holder's inequality this condition. And now we say that psi x belongs to LP star with this. How, how did I get this? So that's the basic definition of the norm of an operator. So if you remember that norm of an operator T was soup norm, norm of X is equals to one. Wasn't it this? So that's, that's the exact thing that we do here. So if I have norm of T is less than or equal to, or should I say that so I can say that norm of psi x is equal to soup norm of psi x y norm of y is equals to one. Can I say that? Of course, look at this formula and draw the correspondence. And now I know that since this thing is less than or equal to, I can say that the supremum of this thing has also to be less than or equal to this quantity here. You see, can you draw the uh, Can you draw the inference that if norm of psi x is equals to soup norm of psi x y, then and if norm of psi x y is less than or equal to norm of x in q space and norm of y in p space, then indeed I can say that norm of psi x in space LP star has to be less than or equal to norm of x in my space q. 
again if you further want to understand why this happened we have always seen this case that you know tx is less than or equal to norm of t norm of x okay and i also say that okay tx is less than or equal to m times norm of x so therefore i can say that norm of t is less than or equal to m that's the exact same thing i'm doing here so now i have proved that this functional psi x see this is a functional and this psi x belongs to lp star and the psi x is linear linearity is trivial so i would um, skip the proof of linearity here but now we go to the real important thing here so i can see that this psi took element from my space LQ to an element in space LP star. So the psi is a mapping. I've drawn it here. So psi takes some things in LQ to something in LP star. Now I want to prove that this psi has got these three magical properties. One, one onto an isometry I can say injectivity too so um, I can say that so let's start with proving the subjectivity what is the strategy to prove subjectivity what is um, what what should I do so I'm gonna write a uh, so what is the strategy to prove that this psi is an onto function. So I start with, I take an element t and let me make some space here. So remember, I have to prove the subjectivity of psi. So how do I prove? And where psi takes something from LQ to LP star. Now in all cases of proving subjectivity, what do I need to do first? So I say, step one, say, give me a T belonging to LP star, okay? So give me an element, let's say it, T tilde, belonging to LP star. Step two, I want to find an x tilde belonging to LQ such that psi of x tilde is equals to t tilde. Step three, now I define a xn to be t tilde times of en. What is this en? This en is my basis vectors for my infinite dimensional function space. You can think of this en as, right, this en is, so uh, what are the basis vectors for an infinite dimension? I can say that 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Do you know what I mean? Like if I had three dimension space, then my basis vectors were 1, double, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So if I have an infinite dimensional space, which sounds all wooky, uh, then it essentially means that I have an infinite number of basis vectors. Um, Okay, so I defined my xn to be t tilde en. So, and in step four, check that x tilde is equals to x1, x2, x3. So you have to remember that this x tilde, let's, let me put it at x like this. So this x tilde, which I got by doing this operation. So 
I don't want you to get confused here. This xn is the individual elements of my infinite sequence. So I construct each individual element of my infinite sequence with the help of this formula. So how would I construct x1? A, bit, a good strategy to deal with uh, these capital X and small x is when I mean an individual element of my infinite sequence space, I would rather denote it by a small x. And when I mean my complete infinite sequence space, then I would denote it by capital X. So I can say that x1 is t times e1. And what is e1? t tilde, sorry. So I can say that x1 is t tilde times e1 and e1 is nothing but 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, infinite times. So check that the infinite sequence whose individual elements are defined by this formula indeed satisfy this property psi x or should I say psi x tilde is equals to t tilde. Let's be consistent with the notation so that we don't confuse ourselves in the end. So let's do a quick recap of these four steps. I want to prove that my psi is subjective. How would I prove that? I take an element in LP star, see, and I want to find a x belonging to LQ such that psi of x tilde is equal to t tilde. But I do not know about this x tilde yet. What, how would I find that? So what I do is I take a guess. I define each individual element of my infinite sequence with this formula and then I construct the infinite sequence and then I construct the infinite sequence based upon this formula. So let's let's elaborate a bit more. So guess that my x tilde is t times e1, t tilde e2, t tilde e3 up to infinity and check that it works. Check it works. So let's so let's see how we have done it here. So now we establish the subjectivity of psi, take t belonging to LP star and set xn equals to ten. That's exactly what we did. Now we show that this x belongs to LQ with t is equals to psi x. Okay, this is exactly what I did. So uh, I, I took whatever is written here and made it simplified. To this end, let now remember this is a very rigorous and intensive proof if you have got these four steps till now I think 80% of our work is done so in order to check that x tilde defined with the help of this equation indeed satisfies psi x tilde equals to t tilde what do I do okay I take a zn and I define it like this would not go into doing these calculations because it's basically in an algebra. If you just substitute the value of xn here and raise it to the power p, you will get this quantity because 1 by p plus 1 by q is equals to 1. This is a good mental exercise to check that what we are saying is indeed making sense. So this calculation you can understand easily on your own. It has nothing to do. I just defined zn and I took the pth power of the modulus of Zn and I replace modulus of Zn by this quantity and when I raise it to the pth power then I get this. Now all I need to show through these steps is that this Xn, what was this Xn? This Xn was defined with this formula. You see? This this formula. Okay, each individual element of my infinite sequence. So I take the qth power of this, which is nothing but xn, zn. And then I do a series of simplifications. So let us look at this. I, from this equation, I can get this. You see, it's a simple calculus. It doesn't need to be explain so you have to remember that in every proof consists of two parts the one part is the analysis part 
the part which concerns with understanding the basic idea or notion of the proof. And the another part that we do in between is the trickery. You know, by trickery I mean those those smart, subtle substitutions so as to arrive at the answer that I want. You know, so this is trickery. I, my professor would be very angry if I said this in front of him. So substitute the value of xn and then since my operator t is linear, I can take this out and define it like this. Again, this is a sequence because consider like this. Why is this a sequence? So Zn, some, some Zn, okay? And then it gets multiplied with E1. So Z1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Plus Z2, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And we continue like this. So it just gives me my sequence Zn. You have to remember that this Zn is not yet infinite. Now I can see that this thing has to be less than, if I take norm on both sides, then it has to be less than norm of t in Lp star times this. This was, again, I'm making use of Holder's inequality. And I defined this in my previous step to be equal to this quantity here. Remember, these are petty substitutions. I'm just substituting one value inside of another value. If, if you take a deep breath and focus on these equations yourself, it is, this is nothing special. I mean, it is special, but so now, now is the important part. I, I have that this thing defined here is less than this thing. And remember, it's not necessary to understand each and every line from this part because it's just substitutions. I substitute one value inside another and finally I arrive at this. This is something important. So after doing these steps, I conclude that the Q norm of Xn is indeed bounded. Okay, so I can say that X is indeed an element of LQ because the norm is bounded by T. See, and this is exactly what I wanted to show. I wanted to show that the Q norm does exist, is well defined. That is how I would prove that my X indeed, let's say indeed belongs to LQ. Why does L belongs to X belong to LQ? Because if the Q norm, by Q norm I mean this, uh, is less than infinity or is finite, I can say that this infinite sequence denoted by capital X is an element of my LQ space. So now I have this inequality. Okay, one more important thing to note there is this is applicable for all n. So if I put this n tending to infinity also, then also this thing is applicable. What is applicable? We would make use of this later too. So let me write down. What would we use later? We would use that this thing, which is defined like this, is less than or equal to norm of t in lp star. We will make use of this thing so it's better to note it down. So now I can say that, oh it's written here too. So it follows from this equation. So this part is clear because this is how I defined. If you remember if I defined my xn to be xn was t e n. And the left side, to remember this equation, psi x y was equal to n going from 1 to infinity, x n y n. Now instead of y, if you put e, which is e j or e n, 
let's say it's en. Uh, then what would I get? I would just get psi x ej is nothing but xj. Okay, so it follows from this equation that psi x and t agree on every ej. So for all ej's, psi x and t agree meaning. So if I have psi x, suppose this is a functional and some value here and t is also a functional and some value here. It's very wrong on my part to draw it as uh, curly brackets but as of now let's bear with it. Okay so if I substitute ej, any ej, it would give me the same value and therefore if psi x and t agree on ej then therefore they also agree on span of ej because they are linear that's property of linearity and since psi x and t are continuous they also agree on the closure of the span and i know that the closure of this is equals to lp this is this thing is belonging to my lp space so it is so psi x and t agree on all of lp agree on all of lp and now i can say that since they agree on all of lp therefore t is equals to psi x and i saw before that this was less than or equal to norm of t lp star so therefore if i take norms on both sides then norm of t is equals to norm of psi x but i know that norm of x was less than norm of t so of course norm of x and q is less than norm of psi x and lp star and finally one and two so i had this thing here and if we go back we would see that the very first thing that we proved was this see so we had proved the other side which was psi x lp star less than or equal to x lq and therefore we have psi x norm lp star is equals to norm of x which is nothing but isometry and since we know that all isometries are injective therefore my psi function is injective subjective and isometry and if you remember that was my goal in life in order to prove that there exists an isometric isomorphism from space LQ to space LP star, all I wanted to do was to prove that this function psi exists. It's injective, subjective, and it's an isometry. And therefore, now if you see elements in LQ, that is elements in this space, so this is LQ. So if I say that this psi is an isometric isomorphism between LQ and LP star, it means that elements here can be uniquely identified with elements here. So I can say that these are identical copies of each other. Everything about these two spaces is same. The structure of this space, the only thing that they can differ is in the nature of points. And that brings us to the end of one of the most complicated mind-boggling and amazingly beautiful proofs of functional analysis. See you in the next video.